I wanted to talk about a way to make sure that you're maximizing the amount of forage you have in your food plots. Let's face it, not all of us have room for dozens and dozens of acres of food plots or plant that much and can afford to waste. Um, even here in Minnesota, we're gonna plant 10 to 15 acres here. Um, over in Wisconsin, I'll plant about two acres of food plots. So a drastic difference between the two. It's a lot bigger parcel over here. Over there, we're hunting 32 acres of woods, 30 acres, whatever it is, and then uh, some open fields. And so it doesn't matter if I'm here or there, I can't afford to waste food plot acres. And so I wanna talk about some different types of planting. Now, there's a kitchen sink planting out there we'll get to in a moment. That's where there's the idea that you're throwing all this these seeds into one kitchen sink, just mixing them all together and throwing them out in the field. Some call that diversity. I call it a waste, and I'll explain why. The first one, this is a good illustration right here. This is last year's rye. And this rye was planted around in early September, 200 pounds per acre. And it was meant to offer this green cover crop right here and make sure there was something in this field that lasted all the way through spring green up. Now at spring green up, once this rye stops popping up, the deer don't like to touch it. I mean, they will in extreme cases where they're really lacking food and maybe Northern settings where uh, there's just not enough forage in the woods popping. But boy, as soon as the forage in the woods is growing and popping, that is a time of abundancy in the deer woods. This rye covers before that time. So when we had warm ups in late February, March, and this ground opened up and was exposed to the sun, this rye is standing there waiting green and strong and those deer hammer it. This is an idea right here where if you have small plots, if you're in northern settings, you might only just want to narrow it down to one forage. So I developed layering rye back in the years where you're adding 100 pounds, 100 pounds, 100 pounds. You can even look up layering rye for whitetails and see that. You can see layering rye progression. And that's developed into a lot of other practices with throwing out rye and layering it on the ground. But if you have small food plots, if you're in a northern setting where the deer are just hammering your food plots, then you need to make sure that you maximize the amount of tonnage that is in those given food plots. When you combine forages, there's always a little give and take, even forages that match each other. There's always a little give and take of balance. And so you run that risk of the kitchen sink blend where you're lowering overall volume and attraction and life of the plot to something like this, where it's just a one targeted crop and that's all that you have. However, with this targeted crop, you get maximum tonnage of that specific variety of plant that you're planting. In the case of rye, where you have a lot of deer browse, and it's an area where even if you have low deer numbers, it might be that your plot is the only thing green within miles around. I've had that case in that scenario up in the UP in Michigan. The deer hit it very hard. And something like a brassica plant, something like a soybean plant, they can't withstand the grazing pressure, or even corn. Corn would be gone, you wouldn't even get a stalker barely an ear, you would never get any kind of growth appreciable into the hunting season. So we're looking at what can I plant that's going to be that solitary provider for this food plot. And of course you're limited because there's no diversity, but you have to run that risk. If you put too much diversity in there, it's gonna be eaten down to the dirt before the deer season. And that doesn't do any good for you or the deer herd either. You want something that gives them an adequate, adequate amount of forage going into the winter. And of course that matches up with your hunting season used and herd ability to influence the herd and create that better herd. So that's the case where often when you just have single clover, for example, clover is okay if you're, if you want to increase a deer herd, if you don't want to worry about that doe factory during the summertime or don't need to, if you're establishing new plots, clover can be that plot. I still encourage you to plant clover with a late season, cool season annual as a cover crop. And then you get the clover for the next year. That's always the best way to plant clover. But clover has a short life. You know, you're talking northern settings in those frost dates of late September, October, that clover starts to eventually stop completely growing and every bite's not replaced. And clover does okay, but think of it in this way, in the UP and some of my walking trails or small little pass-through plots that I just had to walk through to get to another one, I would actually plant clover in them so that while they might be available in September, October in those locations when I wasn't really ranging out, really hunting a lot of locations or rut stands or anything, um, I could count on that clover to be diminished and down to the dirt by November so that it was not an attraction. So I quickly learned in a northern setting with that extreme that something like annual rye could be a lot better offering 
If it was just rye at 100 pounds per acre, which was those first early plantings, it wasn't enough. So I found by adding another 100 pounds, and I'd look at that, it'd come up two or three weeks later, and I'd say, you know what, I still have a lot of soil exposed. So I'd even get that third 100 pound rate. In the UP of Michigan, you'd start that third week of August, end in early October. In a uh, Kentucky setting, if you were laying your rye or wheat even, then you'd probably start around Labor Day and then look at every three weeks after that, three to four weeks, adding that other that extra additional 100 pounds as needed. That 100 pounds, that second one will always be needed. But that's targeted for a small plot where you want to combat grazing pressure. The more you slant it towards one variety of seed, the more volume you get. I hope that makes sense. That's an overall common theme. What I do in a lot of mixed agricultural settings, <clears throat> and this is really appropriate for a lot of locations out there where you don't have to worry as much about grazing pressure and you can create that additional diversity. Now, unfortunately, not everyone has heavy uh, planting equipment. So when we use the ultimate no-till system, then I can spread those big seeds and broadcast those big seeds into the standing buckwheat at the end of the summertime. You can just look up ultimate no-till, find that recipe. Um, there's many videos out there that I've created about it. But I can throw those large seeds into the buckwheat. You crush the buckwheat over the large seeds and it aids in germination, holds moisture, keeps you from drying out your soil, ripping up your soil and exposing it to erosion problems. And that's on one half. You know, I can put beans, peas, I can use those larger seeds. I can add a little bit of oats around August 1st. And on, in the case, this is that plot right here that I did that on, I should be pointed at right here. And I top dress that with rye, a couple hundred pounds per acre about five to six weeks later. The reason you don't put rye with a lot of other crops is they compete for the same nutrients or they shade out other plants that are trying to grow, say like a, a sun loving pea or bean. So a lot of people talk about all these mixes. You have to be very careful on the timing of when you put those mixes together. And you can always tell, you know, someone that hasn't been doing this for a long time when they add some type of seed like a rye with a brassica or a rye with a pea and a bean at a high amount because they're just all competing. It shades it out. And, uh, and, and again, you're hurting overall volume in the end. So I'm using a minimum amount of seed, four to six seeds on each half of this plot. In this case over here, 100 pounds of peas per acre, 50 pounds of beans, and then 30 to 40 pounds of oats per acre, and then top dress it with 200 pounds of rye about five, six, five to six weeks later. The reason for that is I don't want that rye competing with those candy crops or green initially. It's going to outcompete them. That's why you plant them about five, six weeks apart. And what does that do in the end? You get more diversity because you have more volume of each one of those seeds that you're putting in there. So I'm getting almost full growth between oats, peas, beans. By the time they're starting to get eaten down, early September, mid-September, I have that reinforcing layer of rye right over the top of it at 200 pounds per acre. A lot of seed per acre, but again, you're trying to maximize diversity. You can't maximize diversity if you don't get enough volume. So in the case right here, I'm getting that maximum volume for those seeds planted, but it's not all. It's really important you step back and look on this other half. This is where I plant that brassica blend. And I'm adding that brassica blend. I wanna make sure that there's a, a very low percentage of Dorsex, Dorfessex rape or none at all. I wanna make sure there's no sugar beets in there because sugar beets need to be planted about two months before brassicas and it's just something to add in there. People say, oh, I'm adding sugar beets because they need diversity. Well, if there's no volume there, there's no appreciative forage or attraction for deer, then don't slap yourself on the back. It's really not adding anything else to your food plot. So that's why I don't want sugar beets in there. That's a bad blend. I don't want a high percentage of Dorf, Dorfessex rape. I looked in a mix the other day, it was about 33% of that entire brassica blend was dwarf Essex rape. If you look at its overall contribution to the entire mix. So in here, I want that brassica blend. And if I'm in an area where they're not hitting the brassica as much, why do you want brassica? Because it's highly nutritious, it's full of moisture, and there's a lot of volume. You get a great amount of tonnage per acre. You get that tonnage per acre in about 10 weeks. You get that same amount of tonnage per acre or less with clover over a five month period. So very short, cool season annual. Again, you're targeting lots of volume for maximum nutrition and attraction. And if they have trouble eating the brassica, you can add 50 pounds of beans and 25 pounds of peas. They're all leafy green. They grow about at the same rate or vice versa, 25 pounds of beans, 50 pounds of peas. Bottom line is you're adding a candy crop to that brassica so the deer start to give that attention. And then you're maximizing again because those 
those forages are not going to compete. They're going to grow at the same time. The deer are going to pick out the peas and the beans. It'll establish the use of the plot on the brassica side. And if you have late planted beans and peas on this side, then you're planting seven, eight total seed varieties to make sure. And, and of course, brassica, you have four or five different varieties that like forage turnips, forage rapes, and, uh, and then a good percentage of radish in there too, tillage radish. So there's a lot of different seeds, you know, types of seeds, but as far as varieties, there's not much in there. And you're maximizing the brassica side to get high volume, the highest volume you can with those seeds. And then you're maximizing the rye, oats, late planted peas and beans side. So you're getting the most level of nutrition attraction on that plot and you're getting the most volume for those seeds because they're not fighting against each other. And that brings up the kitchen sink. I've seen people online, they'll throw 12, 15, 20 different seeds into a kitchen blend sink. Sugar bees, peas, beans, oats, wheat, rye, a huge amount of diversity. And they'll throw in some exotics, you know, some sun hemp, maybe in some buckwheat, even though it's gonna die and they're not gonna have any value. And a lot of these plants are competing against each other. And that's the problem. You know, rye will outcompete those beans and peas if planted at the same time. Rye will outcompete the, the uh, uh, brassica if it's be, uh, planted at the same time. In fact, the rye has a weed suppressant natural built in. That's why you can see hardly any weeds here. If you look at in this field, there's hardly any weeds or weed growth. And if there are, they're just low broadleaf, hardly any in here. See some yellow rockets are, look out here. We have a diversity of, of weed growth because the sun's hitting the soil. So the rye is a smother crop in the springtime right here, but most importantly, it has a natural weed suppressant. So these blends that are put together, you, you know, this middle portion where you have these two strips, you're maximizing the volume. That's that balance where you're getting the most volume for those seeds planted and a high level of diversity. Where if you just plant this rye right here, and even if you layer it, you're trying to get something that'll be green for the entire season, but you're trying to withstand browsing pressure. And then you have the kitchen sink blends. The problem with them, again, they're all fighting each other. The rye against the beans and peas, the rye against the brassica and oats, would outcompete brassica, wheat would outcompete brassica. Same with the beans and peas. You know, there's it's just there's certain seeds you can't mix together. So when you're adding that multitude of seeds, even if I threw all this into one pot, threw it out there, they're fighting with each, with each other. And even though I could say there's diversity across the plot, you're getting low volume that doesn't last the entire season and your volume is suffering. So that's why you don't mix certain seeds. You don't put 15, 12 into one pot. There's that balance, three or four on this side, three or four on this side, eight different seed varieties total, but maximizing value of those, those two seed groups. And then of course you have the highest volume single source planting, which always isn't, isn't always the best for the deer, but you're trying to attack um, overall browsing pressure on the plot. So why don't you think about that when you're looking at seed blends? You know, just because it has 12, 15 different seeds in the bag and calls it diversity is not a good thing because your volume is going to suffer. Now I'll leave you with one thing. You know, a lot of times rye is the, is the most tolerant and graze tolerant. That's not to say that you can't start a decent sized hunting plot. Like we have some here that are a quarter acre, fifth of an acre, third of an acre, and they're complemented with these larger food sources. I will add blends there sometimes. Sometimes I know the brassica is not gonna do well because of the browsing pressure. So then I'll create that be this side right here where I have the beans and the peas, light oats, and then I top dress it with heavy rye. The heavy rye is always a, save, always a saving grace. And so on a small hunting plot, even when you have these bigger plots to help support it that are true holding plots before we send them out to the diversity food sources after night or after dark, then I at least have a good combination in there. Sometimes on hunting plots, if I know that there's a chance these deer are gonna devour it, but at the same time, I could get a little bit more diversity, then I'll add the brassicas on one side and then I'll put the oats, peas. I'll do the same blends that I'm doing out here in the big plots and really keep an eye on it because if those brassicas get eaten down, I wanna make sure that I top dress those with 200 pounds per acre of rye along with the intended layering on the other side of the beans, peas, and light oats. So I'll do that a lot of times within these mixed ag areas where that plot might last a little bit longer. But if I tried that up in the UP of Michigan, Northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, upstate New York, areas of Pennsylvania, Kentucky, where it's, there's a lot of woods, then that, that uh, plot, because of the diversity, will get eaten down to the ground 
and it won't last. So I hope that explains, especially these three levels, the single source for highest maximum volume, the stripped out plots where you target different groups that actually complement and match each other on either side so you can maximize the tonnage for those four just planted. And then please avoid those kitchen sink blends that have 8, 10, 12, 15, even 20 different diversities and varieties in here that actually create and lower the amount of volume that you could expect. That diminishes the life of the plot and it doesn't make your food plot system and heck even the land that you're managing very efficient. So you want to make sure you try to hit that balance and maximize your forage for the health of your deer, for your hunting, and for your ability to be a true herd influencer this fall. Hey guys, I really appreciate you watching today's video. We're out here having some fun today. We're planting some switchgrass, cutting some timber, making some bedding areas, but most importantly, we're putting it all together and that's critical. Any habitat improvements that you're making, you can't just make improvements because it's a good spot. You have to link those together so that it helps your hunt this fall. Really, I encourage you to check out my web classes. The link is in the description. It's helped a lot of folks design their properties and do what we're out here having fun doing right now.